gasoline, number one priority of mechanized war. Now revealed at last is the secret of the pipeline under the channel from Britain to Europe. Innocent looking buildings near the English coast concealed pumping stations. Long before D-Day, preparations began. Hollow lead cables were carefully insulated, then wrapped with steel wire. This was one type of cable. In other secret plants, steel pipe was being welded into enormous lengths, each section 4,000 feet long. Strong, but amazingly flexible, as these pictures show. Then British ships began the miraculous task of laying five million pounds of hollow tubing on the bottom of the English Channel. The daring plan, conceived by the British in 1942, had been called impossible by experts. A pipeline to carry oil and gasoline under the sea, to supply an army fighting many miles away with precious fuel. Now the plan was a reality. Huge steel drums towed across the channel laid out cable as they went. The impossible was being accomplished. The ships reached the Cherbourg beaches. The first cross-channel pipeline was ready to pump oil to the armies already in France. From the launching of the operation, the rate of supply quickly reached one million gallons a day. Direct connections ran as far as Frankfurt, Germany. Altogether, 120 million gallons were delivered to combat forces. In fuel tanks along the Ruhr was gasoline that had been pumped over 200 miles. Fuel for the Battle of Germany, non-stop from the cliffs of Dover. Fuel for the trucks and tanks and machines of war, thanks to a miracle of engineering achievement. I wish to make it absolutely clear that the primary objective of the United States foreign policy is to continue and strengthen in the period of the peace, that wartime solidarity which has made possible the defeat of Germany. This is as true of our relations with the Soviet Union as it is with our relations with the United Kingdom, with China, and with France. There have been differences between us, and there will continue to be differences between us. But the effectiveness of our wartime collaboration has demonstrated that our differences can be adjusted. It is our purpose to seek constantly to broaden the scope of our agreement and to reach common understanding on these matters where it does not yet exist. We have the right to expect the same spirit and the same approach on the part of our great allies. Okinawa, Japanese island dominating the approach to the enemy homeland. The United States Navy hurls thousands of shells into enemy positions. On land, the heaviest artillery battles of the Pacific War are raging.
Buckner, 10th Army Commander, supervises operation. Flame-throwing tanks assault enemy dugouts as men of the 7th Army Division move up on foot. The attack on Tomb Hill en route to Yonabaru Airfield in southeastern Okinawa. The perpendicular heights are scaled with landing nets. A hillside cave, typical of positions which the Japanese have defended fiercely. The army is cleaning them out. And so are the Marines, who push up through soggy mud on the southwestern flank under General Buckner's command. New rainstorms have made progress difficult. But the grinding advance has moved on into Shori, Yonabaru, and Naha Island capital. Marines keep cover, then advance, gaining one position at a time. up in the valley and the hills around the ground attack moves forward Medical corpsmen in the foreground rescue a wounded man. In the background, fighting rages. This is Okinawa. Japan has told her people that this island is vital to the safety of the homeland. Hitler's Berchtesgaden retreat. Burned by SS troops in the war's last days, the chalet from which he hoped to rule the world now lies in ruins. American Air Force's pictures show the huge gutted rooms and the great window through which the Fuhrer gazed out on the Alps. German laborers clean up the rubble-strewn area which was once Hitler's backyard. Near Berchtesgaden, the 101st Airborne Division uncovers Hermann Goering's personal art collection, hidden in a subterranean chamber. 1,200 artworks worth untold millions are included. The treasures will go back to rightful owners in pillaged nations. At another Alpine retreat, one of many high-axis war makers, Field Marshal Gert von Rundstedt, is interned by the Allies. Capture by the 7th Army ends the career of the former West Front commander who directed the von Rundstedt breakthrough in the Ardennes. Field Marshal Kesselring, arrogant to the last, beaten in Italy and again in Germany, was one of Hitler's favorites. He is through, too. Albert Frank, hated traitor and German state minister in Czechoslovakia, is now awaiting trial. Field Marshal von Kleist, who led campaigns in Poland, France, Russia, and the Balkans, is taken into custody, as is the henchman of Mussolini, Italian Marshal Graziani, fascist high commander. In allied hands at Narnbach, Germany, is Admiral Horty, former dictator of Hungary and Hitler satellite. And in Bolzano, Italy, correspondents interview Margaret Himmler, widow of the Gestapo arch-terrorist Heinrich Himmler, with their daughter Gudrun. Himmler himself committed suicide in prison. The biggest of them all yet taken is Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering, Number two Nazi, general of the Wehrmacht, founder of the Luftwaffe, famous for his fancy uniforms. 
this war criminal, directly responsible for civilian bombings and for mass atrocities, gave himself up near Augsburg, Germany. For Hermann Goering, as for the others in the gallery of Axis war criminals, this is the end of the road.